Uh, if you drive around an area like Sedgwick Reserve, you would think the oak woodland looks like it's in great shape. You see lots of oaks, you see green grasses under them. In fact, if you take a longer view, there's a concern that the oaks are not regenerating, that there's a slow decline in the number of oaks across the landscape. It introduces these young students to biology as a viable field for them to go into, to study. And I think very importantly for the young girls, the fourth through sixth grade girls, it shows them that females like myself are scientists and that it is possible for them to pursue a career in science. It never occurs to people that, that you can study soil or that there's important and interesting science that, that happens down there and that you can't understand an ecosystem unless you include understanding what the soils are doing, how they supply nutrients, how they control water availability, how they really control the physical structure of the landscape, why it has the slopes and structures it does. It's all below ground. It's all in the soil. Well, California has been uh, invaded by alien species of plants, mostly from the Mediterranean area. Uh, this conversion took place over the last 100 to 200 years. If you look up on the hillsides here, uh, it looks green, looks like it's, these plants belong here, but in fact there's virtually nothing that you see up there other than the trees that are native species. And so the question is, the, the important ecological question is, what has allowed this to happen? And if we're interested in restoring native communities, is there anything we can do about it? The University of California Natural Reserve System provides a testing ground for developing innovative solutions to California's tough environmental and educational challenges. With more than 30 sites dedicated to teaching, research, and public outreach, NRS reserves can be found throughout the state. The Sedgwick Reserve near UC Santa Barbara provides a perfect example of the kinds of activities that go on throughout the system. Here, UC faculty and staff are exploring ways to preserve the state's disappearing oak woodlands and restore native grasslands. Delving deep into the earth to understand the microorganisms that support California's ecosystems and pioneering new ways to serve the state's diverse student population. Located on the edge of the Santa Ynez Valley, the almost 6,000 acre reserve sweeps down from the San Rafael Mountains and crosses a major earthquake fault. Meadows of wildflowers and aromatic coastal sage in the uplands gradually transition to dense oak woodlands and lush savanna ecosystems in the lower reaches of this rolling stream-cut landscape. Dr. Michael Williams is the reserve director. Well, the Cedric Reserve is, a, is a, a tremendous holding for the university, probably because of its size and the fact that it, the boundaries of the reserve incorporate two entire watersheds. And uh, they're completely captured in the boundaries of the reserve, so permanently within UC's control. So as far as research goes, we can actually set up research projects here on a watershed level uh, and not have them disturbed or perturbed by adjoining land uses for the most part. Community support is essential to the success of the reserve. Many people in the area volunteer to serve as docents at the reserve, leading public tours and conducting educational programs for school groups. Without an outreach program, you can't get people excited about a site. And the outreach also is a, fits into the mission of the NRS for public service and uh, to actually show people in a very controlled setting. We don't allow open use of the reserve. But with trained docents, um, we can have classes come out here and see research happening. The nice thing about outreach for me, for me personally is I like to see kids get excited about science, to see it in action. Can you remember any of the purple. names of the grasses? Purple needle grass. Purple, purple needle, needle grass. grass. Excellent. And what's the other one in California? Brome. Brome. Cool. Good job, you guys. The special programs we have that are under um, the, the uh, oversight of the outreach coordinator is a, one program in particular called Kids in Nature, where we bring low-income, uh, poor-performing school district kids from throughout currently Santa Barbara County, but that will be expanding into other adjoining counties this next year. Uh, we bring them in for almost um, 
a whole year of interaction, and that includes a number of field trips here to work on a restoration project and to work on the biology of the plants they're using in the restoration project and to understand the communities under which the restoration project's taking place, and it just keeps multiplying itself out. Then they go on campus and they actually learn about plant anatomy, and they look at the anatomy of the very plants they're planting out here. And then they've got computer games that they can take back with them to the classroom that are developed specifically of plants at Sedgwick. So they can mimic how to plant purple sage at the Sedgwick terraces that we're having them work on. And they can do that in their classroom between the next field trip. They come back out here and they start asking more questions that they've learned or that's been generated by the games. And it's turned into, it's like a snowball rolling down a slope. It's just growing and growing. And now we've got people calling us really from all over California saying, tell us more about your programs. How could we have teachers come and do retreats out there and learn about how the program's done and bring that home? The Kids in Nature program draws on the resources of both the reserve and the campus. Professor Jennifer Torsch and her students at UC Santa Barbara played a key role in creating and running the program. My concept was to bring botany to K through 12 students and bring them to the university for experiences in the laboratory and also at our natural area sites on campus. Sedgwick Reserve was running their own schools program. We learned about each other's program, so we met and a collaboration was born and Kids in Nature was the result. This year's activities end with a day-long celebration that brings all of the participating classes to Sedgwick. Here, students present the results of their research projects, participate in special activities, and enjoy one last day with the docents they've worked with throughout the year. Elizabeth? She did, she did the... Which California. one did you do? I did the one in the top, Golden Poppy, oh. and the California, California Buttercup. Butter you did such a good job. Thank you. It's very beautiful because you get to see um, real nature um, and real animals and um, I just like the nature. Our project we did is for to resident our, our classroom from our school. It, um, we have pictures and graphs and reports that we did. <laughs> we have, one of our graphs are all the plants we uh, planted and the grew and shrunk. We planted a, a grapevine, a, grapevine a, jet, a purple needle grass and a blue wild, 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 wild rice. A blue wild rice. The teachers have been impressed by the impact the program has had on their students. Where I teach, the kids come, um, their home language is Spanish, and so they come a little bit lower in their reading level. And um, I think that um, all of this hands-on writing, it's all activities that help them with their speaking ability, because they have to do reports in front of the class on different birds or different trees. Um, and so it's a, it's a great way to get them to speak and to um, learn new vocabulary. I think the impact that Kids in Nature is having is probably more far-reaching than we will even begin to understand. Not only are they introduced to the university environment, many of these children have never ever been on a university campus and the concept of going to college is not in their realm. The visits to the university familiarize them with what a university is and we all try and be extremely positive when these students are on campus and show them that they can come here too. And I think that's a wonderful use of a natural reserve site. Again, it's very controlled, research sites are protected. Um, the kids are, get to meet a lot of the researchers during these programs. Um, and, the, and these are kids that probably a lot of the times would have gone on and worked as um, cooks at McDonald's and things like this. But suddenly they're very interested in sciences. And the teachers that are, we're working with are so excited about how they've seen those kids change in the year they've been involved here. It's a real, um, uh, it's a great opportunity. And I think often, especially young girls, at the ages between the fourth grade and sixth grade begin to believe that they cannot be scientists or that it's not a cool thing to do. And so we try and show them 
that you can be anything you want to be. And also, I think science is really interesting. And by and large, it's not taught in a really hands-on teaching by doing rather than teaching by telling. And so this program not only has them doing experiments in the labs at UCSB, but they're out here in this beautiful environment, tending their own research plots and seeing what plants will grow, why their plants have died, whether it's been due to dry conditions or insects have eaten them, or they've been chewed up by ground squirrels or gophers. Though outreach is a major focus at Sedgwick, the reserve's primary users are research scientists. Soil ecologist Josh Schimmel, for example, has developed an entirely new approach to studying the microbes that are the basis for life on Earth. He has taken advantage of the reserve's protected landscape to take a deeper look at these microbes. Five meters deep, to be exact. I've been studying how soil processes make ecosystems work for most of my career. Um, it's sort of the underappreciated part of ecosystems, I think, because they tend to be out of sight. While most scientists who study microbes look just at the first 10 centimeters around the roots of plants, Schimmel created an observatory that would allow him to study the complete soil profile. In fact, soils here, like you're standing on, are, are you know, six, ten feet deep. And down deeper in the soil, it, there's not as much happening, but ten feet of not much compared to four or five inches of very active and the, these deep soils end up being very important in terms of really controlling a lot of what happens. A lot of what happens happens down deep and roots penetrate down there and water moves down there. And so uh, Trish Holden, my collaborator on this project, we were interested in thinking about what happens through the entire soil profile and studying soil biological phenomenon and microbial communities in soil through the entire profile, not just the top 10 centimeters. And so what we wanted to do is, was develop a system where we could go in and instrument it and monitor it and study it and really understand life through the entire profile. Schimmel and his team hired a local contractor with a backhoe, built reinforcing scaffolding out of military surplus materials from a nearby Air Force base and created the world's first deep soil observatory. Schimmel calls it a petatron, or soil instrument. Soils in the surface, right down here in the grass, are very rich. There's a lot of substrate, there's a lot of food for the microbes. They're also very stressful. They wet and they dry, they get rained on, they, they dry out, there's temperature variations. So it's rich but, but, a, but a harsh environment. Down deep, things change slowly, so it's not very stressful but it's also very poor in terms of food and, and resources for microbes and so there are these very intense gradients of of the things that control microbial life and we want to understand those gradients using laboratory techniques originally developed for medical research schimmel can identify specific microbes taken from the walls of the petatron and determine what role they play in the soil ecosystem and we now monitor temperature moisture, soil gases, soil water, and just monitor the physical and chemical environment that microbes are living in. Periodically we go in and we take samples and we analyze them for various kinds of biological processes in terms of decomposition and nutrient cycling. We use a variety of, of DNA-based techniques to try to understand who is present in these soils and if the organisms down deep in the profiles are the same organisms as live in the surface, just fewer of them, or where there's a unique community that lives down two, three, four meters into the soil profile. Sedgwick is a really great place for a lot of this kind of work, in part because it's very representative of the kinds of soils and ecosystems in much of California. It's easily accessible to Santa Barbara, and so we can get in and get in regularly to collect data and collect samples and bring samples back to the lab quickly without having long storage problems. There's a lot of other kinds of research going on. For example, this hill slope right behind us, Oliver Chadwick has been studying intensively for understanding soil depth and moisture and its relationship to landscape structure. And so that's why we, we did the study here, because we knew something about soils and, and how they related to landscapes. Bruce Mahal and Frank Davis have set up these wonderful grazing experiments that we're tying into to understand how grazing and landscape structure affect soil processes. And so Sedgwick has given us this, this 
environment where a lot of different research groups are coming together and so we can all ask related kinds of questions to make a, a story that ultimately is bigger than any of those individual pieces or even bigger than the sum of all those pieces. Where Schimmel's research focuses on what's happening underground, Jim Richman, Eric Seabloom, and their research team are more concerned with what's happening on the surface. At Sedgwick Reserve, as in most of California, the vast majority of grasses that cover the hillsides and valleys are exotic species that arrived with European settlers. In a series of experiments being conducted throughout the reserve, this team is seeking to determine why invasive plants are so successful and what can be done to restore California's native plants. In general, the native species are perennial forms, that is, they they complete their life cycle over several or many years, uh, much like trees and shrubs. Uh, the invasive species are annuals, that is, they complete, they, they germinate from seed, they grow up and reproduce and produce more seeds within a single year. So there are these two major life habits uh, that are represented here. And in general, the annual species tend to be what we might think of as weeds, that is, they come in and take advantage of circumstances of disturbances of various types, and they're very successful. And so these often are the plants you see growing along roadsides and so forth, or in heavily grazed areas. Uh, the more the native species, the perennials, uh, last longer, they take longer, generally take longer to do things. They're kind of uh, in it for the long haul in a sense, much like a tree might last for hundreds of years and uh, you know, only occasionally reproduce very successfully, whereas an annual basically has to do everything you know, within one year. So that's a big part of what we're testing here is this annual lifestyle versus a perennial lifestyle and uh, what are the characteristics of the plants, how do they differ and how do they compare to each other. The team is running a series of experiments at several different levels. First, they grow native and exotic species in separate plots. One of the basic theories in ecology which explains why one species will do better than another is how it uses resources. So the, the idea is that a species that can grow and continue to reproduce on lower amounts of resources is going to be able to outcompete a species which requires more resources. By growing each species separately and measuring the nitrogen and carbon underneath them, the researchers determine which plants are more efficient and theoretically more competitive. The next step up in terms of complexity is we're looking at two suites of species. We're looking at plots which are a mix of exotic annual species and plots that are primarily composed of native perennial species. So in this experiment here, we've experimentally gone in and planted exotic annuals and then right next to it we've got plots where they're native perennials. And the reason we're doing that is one of our questions is what allows species to invade back and forth? And it's interesting both ways. So the, the primary question would be to consider what allowed the exotic species to invade into the natives. And so to figure out that part, you take exotic annual seed and put it on stands of natives. The other side of the coin, in a sense, is the complement to that is saying what would allow you to restore the natives again. And so that's taking native seed and putting it onto exotic annuals. After determining how exotics and natives compete one-on-one, -on -one, the researchers then go one more step to more closely simulate natural conditions. The next scale up that we look at are in these big plots, which are, these are 20 by 20 meters, and in here all the species are present. So all the, all the natives, all the exotics. One of the, the interesting things in this experiment is we're looking at the effects of pocket gophers. And pocket gophers have strong effects on spatial structure in grasslands, whether plants are clustered together, whether they're distributed randomly or evenly. And so it's only by having a bigger plot that you can start to figure that out. Other factors that affect that sort of spatial structure are burning. So these big plots are burned. Some of them have nitrogen addition. And this allows us to, to start to scale up from the more controlled experiments to an even more sort of natural setting with all the players present. The final test plots are situated in natural grasslands that contain both native and exotic species. We're not adding any species. These are just out in the landscape. The species, the natural species, the exotic species that are present, and then we do some of the similar treatments to them. 
In this case, we have to be a little bit more careful because we don't want to do treatments which are going to damage the, the native community. But the benefit in working there is it's sort of an acid test of our more experimental work to see if it works and our predictions from the experiments work in this more natural setting. The results of these experiments are surprising. If you look at the, the number of exotic species that are in California grasslands, almost all of California grasslands are exotic now, you'd probably come to the reasonable conclusion that they're just better competitors. In some of the really interesting and intriguing results that are coming out of these experiments is that it seems like that's not the case. When we add seed of exotic species onto intact, undisturbed stands of natives, there's no increase, so you don't get more exotics. The interesting part is if you add seeds of native species onto exotic species, they're able to invade. And this was uh, very counterintuitive, and it's part of the fun of doing field sciences that often do, does things you don't expect. Um, and this happens across a wide range of conditions. It happens um, under lots of water availability in our watering treatments with nitrogen. It also um, happens when, whether we burned or not. And so we're, we're pretty comfortable that this seems to be fairly general in the sense that we've, we've done a lot of treatments and it seems to, to, uh, to happen in all of them. The mix of natural and controlled settings required for these investigations could only be found in a protected reserve. We have about seven acres of experiments. It's very rare that you have this large an area available to do these experiments. We have 45 plots that are 20 meters on a side and many smaller plots like the ones you see around me here. So the scale is very important. Uh, secondly, is the, the nature of our experiments is to compare groups of plants against each other. Uh, many experiments, uh, very solid experiments that have been done in the past have uh, compared individual species versus each other. And the real world doesn't work that way real world is made of communities of organisms and numerous species and that's something we've been able to do out here. Huge oaks tower over the reserve's grasslands. Most people assume these great oaks will always be part of the California landscape, but that's not necessarily true. Some oak species like these valley oaks are in decline throughout much of the state. The Santa Barbara County Oak Restoration Project was established in the early 90s to identify the reasons for this decline and develop techniques for reversing it. When you look at the oaks here, you'll see lots of larger, older oaks, and you don't see any smaller, younger oaks. And uh, oaks live a long time. These oaks live for two to three to even four or five hundred years, depending on the species. And so change is slow. Um, you need long-term studies to even really understand uh, what's, what the long-term trends in the populations are. But the first cause for concern was that we just didn't see any young oaks in these populations. Then, of course, there was uh, the series of questions. What's causing that absence of young oaks? Is it natural? Is it something that's caused by cattle grazing? Is it something that's caused by uh, competition with the weeds in the understory of these oak woodlands now? Is it caused by rodents that may be more abundant or less abundant now? Uh, there are a lot of issues, and the problem is there's no single easily identified factor. And there's something like 600 acres of land that's actually involved with the project, maybe a little bit more than that, depending on how you count it. And the, the fundamental design is, that, um, is based upon the effects of cattle grazing. And if you talk to ranchers, um, and other people around Santa Barbara County and ask what's the problem with oaks, they automatically point to cattle. And uh, we're finding it's not as simple as that, um, but that was a starting point and that was a, a major issue with the county as, as well as with us, and we had to try to answer that question. Most of the reserves don't have cattle grazing. And we've had an experimental herd at Sedgwick here for the last eight years because we believe right from the outset that if you're going to study oak woodlands in California, understand their ecology. Cattle are a large part of that ecology now. Probably 85% of the oak woodlands are actually grazed. Just one other point about oak woodlands, uh, most of them are, in, are privately owned. Uh, roughly 90% of the oak woodlands, if you include valley oaks as well as blue oaks. And so actually getting access to places to conduct long-term controlled studies is not simple. And that's why a place like Sedgwick Reserve presents such a great opportunity for us. We've set up paired plots uh, to look at basically direct and indirect effects of grazing. 
um, we would choose two plots that were similar to each other. They had uh, valley oaks in the center, um, or primarily valley oaks in the center, and uh, then we chose by random, generally by flipping a coin, uh, which of those would exclude cattle and which would have cattle uh, grazing present. And um, within each of those plots, then we set up smaller treatments. Uh, inside these cages, this uh, excludes large animals like cattle, um, deer, and pigs. And so we planted acorns inside on this part. And then we also have a smaller mesh cage. And this keeps out gophers and ground squirrels uh, and small rodents. And the third treatment is outside of any cage so that's accessible to all grazers. And with that we're trying to look at what various impact uh, small mammals versus large mammals have on establishment of oaks. So we plant uh, something over 2,000 seedlings every year that we can plant seedlings. And one of the issues that we ran into right away with the project is that the oaks don't produce acorns every year. There are some years, like this last year, where virtually no acorns were produced. And then there are other years when there are millions of acorns that are produced. So this became an important component of our project, and, and we were limited in the, in the years that we could plant by the acorn production. The protected lands of the Sedgwick Reserve provided the perfect setting where researchers could plant acorns and carefully monitor the growth of the seedlings year after year. Here's our results <laughs> in a nutshell, uh, is that the main treatment where we have had successful recruitment are these where they're protected from all animals. Even though cattle have sort of a bad rap in the public opinion relative to oaks, many ranchers feel that cattle may uh, encourage oak uh, establishment because they get rid of a lot of these annual grasses and herbs that may be competing with the oak seedlings. In some of the places in, in our plots where we've excluded cattle now for um, since 1995, so seven years, there's pretty thick growth of, of uh, grasses and it's difficult for the young seedlings to uh, emerge from that. So cattle have a potentially positive indirect effect by kind of mowing the area around where the seedlings are. So it's one of the things we're looking at, but uh, we haven't seen a really clear positive or negative effect of cattle grazing at this point. Finding solutions to California's environmental and educational challenges requires long-term effort. The Sedgwick Reserve and all of the sites in the University of California's natural reserve system provide outdoor laboratories where scientists and educators can research tough questions and develop innovative solutions.